Hello, I'm Dr. Lisa Belial, and you are listening to or watching Radio Maine. Today, I have with me artist Philip Barter. Thank you so much for joining us today. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. Philip, I'm very interested in the work you do. Um, in particular, I'm interested in a lot of the the work you've done with landscapes. And when I'm looking at some of your pieces, um, it seems like there are some some themes for you that that keep coming up. Which is. Well, t- well, tell me about, so for example, this piece that I have behind me, um, there, there's, there's the trees in the foreground, the mountains in the background, you've got water running through it. That seems to be something that I've, I've noticed more than once in your landscapes. Well, uh, yes, I do. I do uh, paint this, you know, similar, similar landscapes a lot. I mean, I, I, I can't see the painting, so I can't. Uh, I don't know which one it is. Oh, okay, yeah, that's a, that's a view of Frenchman's Bay, uh, Cadillac in the background from Sullivan. And so, and that's named across the bay. Across the bay, right? Frenchman's Bay. Very good. Have you spent a lot of time on the water? Uh, I have. Uh, I've worked on the water for years, and uh, I've always been, well, a couple of times when I was away from the water, I got homesick, and I uh, had to come back. But both both West Coast, I worked on boats on the West Coast and on the East Coast. And, and how is it that you began incorporating art into your working life? Uh, well, I, I guess that's easy because you... I always, you know, paint what's familiar, what I'm used to, or what I know, and uh, so that one thing led, you know, to another, and and a lot of it is uh, a lot of the uh, paintings I paint now of boats. That uh, I guess there's not nostalgic, so I've always tried to avoid nostalgia in my work. But for instance, when I when I paint a car, they're usually of the '40s or '50s because that's the only cars I know. I can identify going down the road. That's a thirty-eight Ford, or that's a thirty-seven Chevy, or whatever. So when I paint cars, my painting is they're usually of that vintage, it's just because of what's familiar with. And boats the same way. It's usually the older wooden, uh, wooden style uh, uh, lobster boats, Jonesport style, or or, or uh, Korea, whatever. So yeah, it's something I'm familiar with. And so, tell me about some of your influences, um, some of your earlier artistic influences. Are there artists that you felt like um, you really um, learned from as you were beginning your career? Um, well, yeah, uh, I've always, uh, you know, I used to get in trouble with drawing in school because that's I, I paid more attention to my drawing than I did, uh, you know, school. But uh, in in high school, uh, my first uh, I saw a Van Gogh painting, and it just kind of just really kind of knocked me back that there was that much power in in something that I, I related to. The strong, powerful colors and brush strokes, and and it just took my breath away. And I said, you know, some way or other, I want to uh, be doing that. <laughs> And do you feel like you've gotten closer as time has gone on to to that place that um, you feel like Van Gogh was able to get to? Well, I'm, obviously, as I'm self-taught, I, I learned from the masters, you know, because uh, I studied, you know, I couldn't say I really studied, but I really observed very closely as possible, you know, Van Gogh's work, and I imitated it and copied some paintings, uh, you know, back early. To, 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 to find out just how we did that, how we accomplished, you know, got that effect. And and, and then uh, later, as I was actually studying uh, art in California with my friend uh, Alfonso, uh, uh, I painted with him for two or three years. And uh, in our studies, we did, uh, 
Marsh and Hartley, Marsh and Hartley image came up of lobster fishermen on the on the uh, on the docks at Korea, Maine, and and that really just blew me away. I said, I'm going back to Maine and pick up where this guy left off, and so so that was my goal. I came back and I moved within five miles of Hartley's uh, studio in Korea. I lived in. I bought a piece of property in Goosebro and built a house in the woods and started painting again. And the local uh, a fr part of a friend of mine, uh, um, Dennis Vibert, had a gallery and he started showing my work. That was in the early 60s, mid 60s. And he actually sold, sold some. <laughs> so I think my first check for the for for the I sold three paintings that fall and I got like a check for like twelve hundred dollars and I said wow that that's a whole year I don't have to work I can just stay home and paint so so I did and it kept getting better so I know that um, you like to do things in series and um, one of the series that you've done in the past is the ledges tell me about the ledges. Uh, well, the, the ledgers with the blueberry field in Goolsboro, I think it, with, with red red foreground and yet fall trees and ledges going through the middle. Yeah, that that is a interesting kind of thing because I, I drove by that blueberry field probably for about 25 years before I actually saw it. And and when I did, it was it was a great experience in that composition. All those paintings have a similar composition, but move things around a little bit. And that's what I go by. If I get a good drawing, a good composition, I, I will work that you know, as much as possible to get the most out of it. And lately, I've been going back to sketches that I had a series of 20 years ago and make a new series by focusing in on details within the painting, finding compositions within the, within the painting. And that's been a lot of fun, especially where I don't travel as much, and um, I, I have I don't have so much outside influence. I've been focusing on my own work, and it's been very, very rewarding. Give me an example of one of these details that you've been focusing on from one of your earlier works. Uh, well, yeah, it's easy to show it, but but uh, uh, yeah. Well, actually, what I've been doing, it, it, my wife uses a computer, and so she helps me find these. We we take a painting, and I move it around, and and find really great compositions in it, and that they're they're more abstract uh, because you know it's obviously not the subject that. Uh, that that work that I'm concerned about, so I've been focusing on my more of my painting techniques by having these familiar compositions. I don't have to worry about a composition because there it is. So I focus more on my um, my brush work and my uh, and and the colors and the texture. So, anyway, it's been very very interesting, very rewarding. And what about Scudic Mountain? Is that um, an important um, place for you, and has that proven to be important to your work? Well, yes. I, I see Scudic Mountain every morning when I wake up. It's right, right over there. And, and uh, yeah, it's kind of, a, I guess, an icon or a, a symbol of the area. It's a focal point. It's the, it's the biggest mountain locally. The, the only one. It's not actually a mountain, but it's a big hill, but it's called a mountain. So and, when... And the, and, the, and, the, and the shape of the mountain is really interesting. But it's long... It's not a pinked mountain. It's a slopey, long slope with a, with, a, with a cliff on the end. It's an interesting composition. So if you paint it from the north, there's another... Anyway, I've painted it from all... From the... A whole compass all around it, from the ocean and to the ocean. <laughs> I've painted it in all seasons, so that's that's a wonderful, beautiful thing about Maine is that you 
you know, we just sit in one place and watch everything go by, like the, the seasons and the weather, and you know, it's really, it's really interesting. And everything changes; it's all in flux. The shadows are different in the fall and the spring, and the leaves are green, and then they're yellow, and, and then they're gone, <laughs> and then. <laughs> So so you don't have to move around too much to <laughs> to find paintings. So if you just are willing to sit and observe what's going on around you, then you can actually continually find things to put into your art. Right. Well, that's what I've always identified. My job, uh, my job description is uh, I, I look at things. <laughs> what about? Your floral still lifes. Tell me about those. Well, uh, sometimes they're from the floral arrangements that uh, my wife uh, puts together. And she always had flowers around the house, like right, 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 right there behind their screen is a floral. But, but lately what I've been doing is that when I work when I work in the studio, I usually have a surplus of paint on my palette. And I don't like to waste paint uh, it's, it's expensive for one thing and I don't like to waste anything but uh, so what I do is I have smaller panels always available primed and ready uh, uh, smaller canvases and I'll just take the palette and I just I just throw paint on it without any intent or purpose or anything and eventually after maybe a month or so you know, I start, I can maybe make out something to focus on. And it's usually florals are so easy, you know, because of the color. And there's always a, always different colors all over. You know, when you take it right off your palette with no no intent or purpose, you just put paint on a panel, whatever's there. And that, anyway, and so you have all these varieties of colors. And so it makes a good floral. So it's interesting to hear that, that you are, are starting with the color as opposed to starting with the specific with a specific image in mind. Is that right? Uh, yes. Yeah, and, until I was working, then I'll work the background around, around, and then all of a sudden I can see, you know, I can see something coming out of it. <laughs> And they're, they're a lot of fun, and I, I have them all over the house, and I like, I like them. <laughs> and usually I have antique frames, too, to go with them, so that, that, that makes them a little, makes it more interesting. You also do wood relief sculptures. Mm hmm Tell me about that. Well, I get into that because basically, like I pointed out earlier, if you're doing a series of paintings, then uh, uh, with a good composition, after doing flat paintings and working it as much as I can, then all of a sudden I see maybe I could do the same thing, only do it in wood relief and use different colors, but whatever, but use the same composition and it's a totally different painting. And a totally different uh, experience, and it, it keeps it, it keeps my uh, uh, keeps my sketches going. <laughs> so it sounds like just having that added dimensionality really shifts the way that you're able to approach your art. Right, it's just another, yeah, another venue. Now, I know you mentioned that you've been out on the West Coast and you came back to the East Coast. And in addition, it, it, Santa Fe has appeared in your pieces. So that's sort of somewhat in between the West and the East, more to the West, I guess. That's talk, right. Well, talk to me about uh, that. Well, I, I've always loved the Southwest and the the, um, the person I studied with was from uh, New Mexico. We visited together there a couple of times. And uh, I've always loved that Southwest landscape. And and I found out later that most main artists do love New Mexico, like Hartley from George O'Keefe and uh, other people who've painted in Maine, George Bellows and, you know, anyway, a whole bunch. But uh, uh, what is it? Maybe when I first started, my wife and I, when we 
first we travel in the winter a lot. We used to go, you know, Southwest, Caribbean, wherever. And, uh, but we went to New Mexico for probably 10 years in a row during the winter. We'd go out and spend a month or so. And I went alone camping and hiking and doing mountain things. And yeah, and uh, one year I painted nothing but cactus one year. <laughs> trip to Arizona. So yeah, the Southwest has always been very, uh, very powerful. And I think one of the things I think that's made me uh, at least a, a successful or, or a different artist is that I I bring the Southwest palette to a main landscape and the combination is, is I, th I, I think, works very well for me. So what is it about the Southwest and about Santa Fe, New Mexico, that you think attracts main artists? Oh, I think, uh, well, I've always liked uh, Crazy Cat's comics. <laughs> and it's a crazy cat landscape out there. And, and uh, what's his name? Uh, George. Uh, I can't think of it now. But the... Uh, the artist that made, came up with Crazy Cats was from New York, and he traveled to California to make cartoons, like in Hollywood. And he really got he really got blown away when he saw the landscape in Arizona with those balancing rocks and and uh, and, the, and the funny cactuses, and all the different plants and different. Uh, it's a, it's another world, you know. So uh, <laughs> the desert, instead of the ocean, you got desert. <laughs> The music, I love mariachi music. Do you bring mariachi music back to Maine? Do you listen to it while you're, while you're painting now? I do, I do a lot, yeah. I used to more when I had the CDs and stuff. I always had those going in my studio. But now I'm I, in my studio all the time now. I have it on that classical station, the, the PV, PBS station, where there's just classical music all day. I, I don't have to go jump up and turn it off or change channels or, or anything. So that's always going. <laughs> so as an artist, how much time are you spending in your studio every day? What is your process like? Well, it depends. Sometimes I don't go there all day, but I usually go in the morning for an hour or two, and in the afternoon, an hour or two. Sometimes I'm just uh, working on frames. Sometimes I'm preparing panels. Sometimes I'm just cutting out wood pieces and priming them. Or, so it's not always just creative stuff, but a lot of, uh, there's a lot that goes into a painting besides just the actual painting itself. So I, I keep busy. Uh, but I used to spend all day, almost every day, <laughs> in my studio or or out in, looking for landscapes. So when you go out looking for landscapes, do you sketch them when you're outside? Do you take photos? How do you bring them back into your studio to work on them? Okay. Well, I used to uh, always work from sketches. And then... I work from photographs, but I but instead of just working from the photograph to the painting, I always do a sketch from the photograph. <clears throat> I learned from uh, an artist friend of mine, Ed Gamble, back um, maybe 25 years ago or more, where he always carried this little leather pouch on his side with a pencil and pad in it. And we were talking about it one day, and I asked him why, because I was using big sketch you know, papers and stuff. But he brought out this little pad about that big, and and uh, he said it because it like eliminates detail. You know, if you do it a, a simple sketch, you know, say a three by four inch sketch, and you blow it up to three or four, you know, two or three feet, then you you've expanded it anyway. It makes a wonderful uh, it, it makes the painting simple and, and stronger. I think by working from a smaller sketch and, and exaggerating or building it up. So that's what I, I always carry is a small sketchbook with me ever since then. 
So it's interesting that you work from a smaller sketch and then you build a bigger piece, you create a bigger piece. And then recently your wife has been taking photos of your pieces and bringing it back to a smaller scale again. So it's almost like you've gone full circle. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, because now I'm, is, I'm getting into like this little sketch. I'm getting into like a little, that much of it, you know, and, uh, and then blowing it up, it makes it very, very powerful. And, and, you, and you eliminate the detail. Like George O'Keefe, I think, said that artist's function was to exaggerate, uh, eliminate, and emphasize. So it's like an editing process where you look at something and you edit it down to make it simple. And uh, so that, that's what I do with uh, that's one of, That's one quote I always remember. They always stuck with me. That quote, that because it, it's so true. Because you, how do you decide what to take out and what to leave in when you're looking at a piece? Well, that's done with the sketch. Uh, you know, that's done with the sketch. You eliminate the stuff that doesn't doesn't make a good painting. So by the time you actually make it into a painting you've actually already done all the eliminating and you're able to just move forward with what it is that you want to put on the canvas. Well, that's, that's right. And then the painting itself will speak to you as you're working on it and to modify and to change other things. It's not like you go in with a set mind, but you do go in with a, yeah, with a, an agenda, I guess. <laughs> but, but the painting changes, it, changes you or it makes you change it throughout. Well, des- describe that a little bit for me. As you're looking at a painting and it's speaking to you, what what types of things is it saying? Is it saying, put a little more blue here or make this yeah, pre- area yeah, flatter? Much that. Yeah. yeah, or something's too big or too little or something's not in the right place. <laughs> or, yeah, when you're working on it and you, you have a color, colors in mind, and you and you, it, but that changes. You know, once you get it up there and say, "Well, that color doesn't that doesn't look right." So you know, it's it's always a balancing, you know, flux of work in flux. You know, it, you you know pretty much. Like when I approach the easel, I pretty much know what I'm going to do, but the details will change. You know, little small minutia. You know, things that will change. But, Nothing, but the major painting will come if it if it if it comes out right. Will look pretty much like what you had in your mind when you started it. But, but when you're doing it and you and you see things that can improve, then you then you make another painting of that same with that same sketch, emphasizing something else. So that's why a series of paintings is good for me because when I'm painting the painting, I see other maybe improvements but not on this one, but on another one and so on. That's, I'm glad you explained that to me because I think that that, well, that just, makes a lot of sense. Well, I, I just I just discovered it myself right now. <laughs> <laughs> well, then I, I'm glad you explained it to yourself. <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> thank, thank you for that. <laughs> that's great. So how do you know when one painting in a series is done? I, I know that a lot of artists will say this to me that, you know, I reach the place that I know that it's finished. And I, and I wonder myself as an, as not a painter, um, what, what types of clues do you have to that? Well, that, that's, that's the most difficult part for me. A painting, a painting is knowing when it's done. Um, because I, in the beginning I was criticized for overpainting and, and it was, it was so true. I was overpainting. And, um, uh, so now I'm trying to, you know, I have to discipline myself and just say that's enough, it's, you know, because you, you, you step over the line and it, you, you lose it. So you have to, that's the trickiest part, knowing when to start. <laughs> so again, as a non-painter, what does it mean to overpaint something? Oh, well, uh, to overpaint, I, I guess simply put, it's just a... a putting too much paint on, like changing colors and overpainting. Uh, yeah, I think that's pretty much it, you know. And keeping it fresh, you want you want to 
for the canvas to come through too. To, you know, you don't want to just and your and your drawing. You don't want to lose your drawing and your your visual part too. I mean your your drawing part. So it's it's kind of like the idea of gilding the lily. You, you don't you, you don't want to gild the lily because it's like overpainting. It's too cluttered. It's too much. It's actually get too much gold on. You can't pick it up. That's that's true. That gets heavy, right? <laughs> so there's some practical reasons why not to put too much paint on a on that's a piece. Right. Yes, that's right. you don't want to bury it. You want to bring it to life. You don't want to bury it. <laughs> <laughs> that also is its a great way to think about it. Um, the carrying place. What, what about the carrying place? That's a very poetic name for a piece that I know you've done. Right. Well, historically, uh, I think a uh, carrying place, before they maybe had a bridge on there, they had to carry over this little body of water from, from uh, it's in Hancock. It flows into the Bay I live on. And it's not very wide, but it it's a tidal it's a tidal stream that runs uh, cr across Route One right into Hog Bay from the ocean, and it's a wonderful composition. And I've painted that painting probably thirty or more times uh, in all, like I mentioned before, all different seasons: high tide, low tide, mid middle tide. Uh, you know, all the four seasons. And it's just a wonderful, a wonderful composition. It's a perfect composition. So I, I use it a lot. Well, I have to thank you for that composition because I have, I have enjoyed it for quite a while now in my own personal space. And I also have to thank you for the pieces that um, we have of yours that now live in my office up at the medical center that I work in. So oh, great. Thank you very much. Yes, we have uh, on a regular basis, I have people coming into my office and looking at the pieces and I'm able to explain that these are Philip Barter pieces and they're very special and they're very main. So I appreciate your, uh, your sharing your, yourself with me that way. Thank you very much. And this, you know, uh, to me, you know, and I guess to artists in general, I mean, all art to me is a performing art. You know, it, it's not for myself I do this. It's, it's to share, you know, to share these, this wonder of the creation all around us is so wonderful. And, uh, and you know, it's such a gift that we have that I love to share that, that part of it with others. You know, because I, I believe very strongly, you know, in a loving creator that gave us all this. And and and, and, and I believe that we have to be responsible for it, to, for what, to take care of it. We're caretakers. Well, I also, I agree with you. And um, I'm, I'm really fortunate that, like you, I live in a beautiful place, Maine. And now I get to enjoy Maine through your eyes as well. So that's... That's quite a blessing to me, so I appreciate that. And I know for you, we've we've asked you to do something that um, today, sitting and talking with us on the on the on the podcast and the radio, I know it's something that isn't easy for everybody. So I really am very grateful to you for taking the time to talk with me today and to share some of your insights about art. Well, thank you very much. And as I told you earlier, it's very. It seems very difficult for me now to to uh, to do these kind of things, but I'm I'm glad to be able to do it. But uh, it's, it's a little hard than it used to be. I just I just I'm becoming more rec reclusive. <laughs> well, we're very fortunate that you are willing to um, sit down with us today. It's been a great pleasure to talk with you. Thank you very much, and you have a great day. Thank you. I'm Dr. Lisa Belial, and I've been speaking with artist Philip Barter. You can find his work at the Portland Art Gallery and on the Portland Art Gallery website. I hope you take the time to enjoy his work because he is a truly wonderful Maine artist. Thank you for joining us today. <laughs>